Yeah, um, I suspect that that uh, not everyone is quite as dedicated as you, or um, it's a case of they know that it's going to be recorded, so <laughs> that's fine. Just let me turn off this transcript notice. It's, yeah, I absolutely hate it. Uh, let's rather show chat. Um, you see, when you're on Teams, I see you being on Teams. Is that okay? Right? Yeah. Okay. And then when I do that, you see this. You see yes. the slides. I, yes, I see. Okay. It. I wonder if you can't show both of them. Um, normally they say you normally you can't you can. when you're on. Oh really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. Mm. Hang on, there's another way I can do this. Yeah, okay, uh, stop sharing. Yes, then I can see you. Okay, and then um, let's try again and do browse my computer. And with regards to um, the slides that have voice notes, is that like not allowed? <clears throat> so is that like not allowed to be done anymore? Uh, no, you see, the problem with that is that I absolutely hate it. It's I can never see the reaction, so it's like every point I I need to um, explain, and I. It, it goes on forever. I mean, literally, you get three hour, three <laughs> hour slides. So it's just. Okay. I did that in the in the first year of COVID and absolutely hated it. Uh, so from then onwards, I I just did it um, this way. Okay. Uh, I did yeah live so that it's also you know because otherwise there there's no interaction and actually you need to be able to ask questions. Okay, yeah. no, I I get you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Nokubonga is also in the meeting. Was invited to the meeting. Hopefully, she's easily yeah. there. No, she is here. Okay, that's great. That's great. All right, now are you seeing a screen? Yes. The, are you are you seeing me and the the slide? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. Um, stop me at any. Yeah. I mean, this again. Uh. -huh. uh Sometimes I will carry on explaining something when I don't need to, in which case um, put up your hand or something and then I'll stop or maybe we can use this, uh, the little um, reactions. Yeah, yeah. Show me a thumbs up if you understand and I will move on. Show me a hand if you want me to carry on. Um, and in, sorry, yeah, and, and interrupt me. Um, it's fine. There, there are few enough people here that um, I'm sure that will be fine. Okay. All right. And we are indeed recording. Yes, we are. Okay. Welcome. Good to see people here. Uh, Zintle and Nokubonga. Sorry about that. And Gabriella. All right. So let's see. How do we do this? Oh, there we go. Okay. So just as a way to start, I think it's important that you know uh, how the assessment is, is uh, taking place. There are two parts to this course and they are conceptually, they are separate things. Uh, the course as a whole is contemporary social issues in South Africa and we're looking at two of those. On the one hand, organizations, movements and change. On the other hand, migration and health. Um, so don't, I mean, maybe you can make links between them, um, certainly, I mean, knowledge builds on itself, but don't um, try to, if it's not obvious, yeah, uh, if it doesn't happen naturally, they're not intended to be together. This is just the two things that we're looking at. Um, so they make up, each of them makes up half of the, of the, of the course marks. Uh, your class mark is, and that's your year mark. 
all right, what you see before you go into an exam will be made up of your assignment um, and two reflection pieces. This is new, all right? I sent out a, um, a message about it last week. And those reflection pieces are intended to help you um, focus, uh, to help you relate the material that we're covering in every week, all right, to the topic of the assignment. Because that's what you, you have to be doing. You have to be constantly thinking about how this informs your assignment because that assignment is the most important um, assessment. It comes up again in the November take home. So whereas uh, you used to have an exam, what we do now is take that assignment, uh, we mark it and make comments for how you can improve it. And then you do more work on that and hand it in as your final assessment. All right. Is everyone clear with that? OK, I'm going to assume that you are. All right, so um, that assessment, if you haven't looked at it, you should look at it as soon as possible, the, the assignment topic at least. It's around uh, trade unions in South Africa. Are they still a vibrant force? Are they still um, uh, a way that, that uh, the general public and those who are the non-property, the poor people, all right, who aren't, who aren't catered to by the existing channels, you know, the ones who can't go and hire a lawyer and take cases to the constitutional court. Um, that is how they respond through social movements. That's how the government hears from us normal people. Uh, and trade unions are an essential part of that. Um, they've changed over the years quite remarkably. Um, they've played a, a very important role. But the question that you asked in your assignment is, well, are they still there? You know, are they still playing this role? Um, a good place to start is to read the one of the last readings um, put forward for the for week seven, I think, uh, by Webster, Eddie Webster. It's a short uh, article that was on the Daily Maverick site, and you have it in the the hard copies. If you have a hard copy, alternatively, um, you can. You know, the, the HTTP address is in the, the course outline that's online. All right. I haven't put it online because you can simply click through. And where you would normally find your prescribed readings under the modules, uh, you'll find that with the link that you can click. It'll take you to Daily Maverick. OK, so first thing you should do is read that so that you have an idea of where the course is going and what the question is. OK. All right, anything on that before we move on? No. All right, so if you read uh, the Giddens paper, he starts off, and it might be a little boring because uh, it probably covers stuff that you've done over and over again, but essentially he starts off looking at, at different influences on change, and he says, yes, there are change comes from um, interlinked, uh, factors that you can't really separate. It might be economical predominantly, but that always has has um, lead on effects so that you can look at different areas and he's identifying those different areas so that you so that you remember to always look at the context, always look at the society that you're looking at. What is the economy? What is the political situation? Uh, what is the culture? What is the um, attitude towards uh, um, innovation and change? What is uh, what is your available technology? Just the, the fact of the technology that we have access to um, makes a fundamental difference. Well, maybe not a fundamental difference, but Makes an, makes an enormous difference on the kind of way that, that social change can take place and the kind of influences that, that can drive it. All right, so that's all he's trying to do there is just get you to think in a context. What we're doing in this course is um, looking at what people do, looking at collective action as a group of people coming together. We're focusing on how do people 
change society. All right, so we're taking all of those factors. Yes, they all interlinked. We're focusing on people and organization, how they feed into existing organizations and existing structures of society, and how they change those if they do, but also how those um, existing structures of society, existing institutions, influence the way that collective action takes place and the possible areas that it can or that it's or rather that it's likely to or not likely to take place. In. All right. So we're kind of looking at that that interface. Um, if you think of unions, uh, which is our ultimate uh, focus where we go, uh, it's yes, collective movements. Unions have been as uh, incredibly important as as um, both a result of social movements and collective action, collective action like strikes, uh, but also an influence on collective action that the success of unions uh, provided, well, just a, as one example, provided incentives for people to see that, yes, you know, collective organization can actually make your voices heard if, yeah, uh, particularly for, for people who are disempowered. Um, so we're looking at that and saying, right, but these unions have now become more formal. So then we're looking at the other side and the, the more formal organizations and structures of society and saying, right, how do these two interact? Does it mean that these social movements uh, like unions are, are disempowered at this part? Does it mean that there's a split between the more formal and the less formal? Do they continue to influence each other? All right. OK, so the important part here is to see that what we're talking about is a slow process. It doesn't necessarily happen fast. Small things happen that can have fundamental impact on an outcome. OK, um, let's see if we can think of an example. Um, Formation of Kasatu in the the liberation of South Africa that it provided such a it provided a, a coordinated and in a sense a unifying uh, platform for decentralised resistance movements so that your local committees your um, because of course they had to be very decentralised during apartheid other you know if you if you organised openly you would be killed. So it had to be underground. Um, it had to be dispersed in society. And you could say, well, Kasatu, um, that joining together was was fundamentally significant, not only because it was a consolidation of unions that uh, um, had recently, of the unions that had recently emerged, not that they hadn't been unions before, but that there was this, this um, this lull during the 60s and the 70s, unions re-emerged again, um, and Kusatu was fundamental in bringing those together, but then also had a fundamental impact on the future and the, the, the sustainability of small decentralized struggle against apartheid. Okay, so the changes are fundamental, that the changes that we're looking at, but you don't often see that it is fundamental at the time. It can be very small things that you can't see the the ultimate impact. OK, um, it happens over time and how those actually unfold is is virtually impossible to predict. Uh, one thing I really like about Weber is that he Behind his argument is always an insistence that it depends on the particular context in which something is happening. That, you know, yes, bureaucracies often become um, concentrations of power, but not always. OK, so he's looking at those that particular context. He's saying you can't actually predict. You can think of possible possible ways that this unfolds, but you can't actually predict anything. And what's more, this change is not necessarily uh, 
in one direction. There's stops and starts. There's it's gradual. It's uneven. It's disjointed. Um, uh, if you think about uh, the states and the Roe versus Wade, uh, that's certainly a step backwards, a big step backwards. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the that the whole situ the whole subject is a closed matter. No, you know, um, it is women then uh, respond to that change in in the environment and the the struggle for women's rights continues in response to that. It's not that one setback then means that everything's over. It there's always setbacks and moves. It's gradual and uneven. Okay. Uh, I'm hoping that you're familiar with institutions, but okay. Simple way to think of it is when you can't, when there's something in your society like education, right? How children get educated, and you can't imagine how it would be done if it wasn't for schools. That's an institution, okay? Banking is an institution because we can't imagine how our world, how our society would would operate without a banking system, okay? Uh, religious institutions, again, uh, think of how enmeshed they are in every part of your life, even if you're not religious. Uh, the state is an institution, all right? So those institutions, they organizations um, that have become so entrenched and so much part of our culture and our way of life that we couldn't imagine our society without them. Okay, and those institutions, they they carry a lot of, they almost like the material representation of culture. So they reinforce culture. I mean, think of um, uh, institution of marriage and how that reinforces the patriarchy, the patriarchal system of of men dominating women, of taking your husband's surname, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so institutions embody and reproduce and um, give give body, I suppose, to culture. All right. Okay. So social movements, um, I like Giddens and Danier, uh, but they, they, um, they're points where they are very confusing. Uh, for example, that first quote there, um, I've taken out the first subject of confusion, which is social movements are a form of collective behavior, which sociologists define as actions. What they go on to say there is often disorganized. Now, there's no reason why they are often disorganized. They may be disorganized, but they generally are having some form of organization, might be more or less. Um, I think it's it's confusing. They contradict that further on in the paper. So I'm replacing it with the three dots. So uh, the other confusion about this quote is that People regard, people read it as social movements being disorganized actions, all right? No, that's clearly, that's definitely not it. What he's saying, what they're saying rather, is that social movements are a form of collective behavior. Collective behavior, sociologists define, all right? So social movements are usually quite organized. Okay? They have a, they have a, um, A reason for being, an ideology, um, a way of understanding the world and saying this is a problem, this is why it's a problem, these are the people who should be changing it, this is how we can change it. Okay, uh, They're not generally disorganized. Collective behavior may be disorganized, it may not be disorganized. All right, Collective behavior is defined as actions taken by a large number of people gathered together, usually in defiance of society's norms. Another form of collective behavior is a riot. All right. So we're starting there looking at collective behavior. And I'm going to say collective behavior, collective action, and social action. I'm meaning the same thing. All right. Um, 
I try and say collective behavior or collective action rather than social action, but I often don't. Uh, okay. And collective action itself can be simply defined as people acting together in the pursuit of interests that they share. So, <laughs> forms of collective action. A crowd is not collective action until it becomes focused, right? Uh, a crowd in a supermarket, in a mall, um, on streets, it's just a number of people walking along each of them as individuals with no common purpose. Each of them has their own individual purpose. Their action is not coordinated in any way, okay. except when it comes to traffic lights and things like that. Um, if something happens to, to uh, focus that crowd on a single thing and a single action, for example, um, there's a there's a gunshot, right? Then that focused interaction now becomes a focus on everyone. Here's the gunshot and everyone runs, all right? Uh, panics, that's how panics happen, that it becomes collective when there's something that draws people together and they all um, are focused on one particular outcome, getting out of the building, getting out of the way, not getting shot, all right? A riot is, also on the more disorganized side, in the sense that it's often temporarily bound up and focused. It's not necessarily something that continues days over days over days. It's, it's, um, there are episodes in the moment and then things calm down and then episodes in the moment, all right? It's not like a, okay, you've got the 12 o'clock shift, I'll arrive at the two o'clock shift, okay? Um, but when they do act, they act as a unit. Social movements are seen as more organized. And here again, you see differences between Giddens and Danier, how they, how they uh, regard social movements and the things that they say, that's a social movement and that isn't, uh, as opposed to Tarot. Tarot has a much more uh, rigorous um, criteria that, that he says, organization must meet these sorts of criteria, must be able to do this. And he's primarily looking at their sustainability um, in order to be considered a social movement. Giddens and Danier are quite loose, right? They say it's an organized collective attempt to further common interests or secure a common goal through collective action outside the sphere of established institutions. Outside the sphere of established institutions, that's important. Think of how our society is. The people who are already represented and the ones that this society works for, the ones who don't have their needs unmet, are the wealthier people, are the educated, are the urban people, um, white people. Uh, they have better, they can work, okay? Wealthy people can work within this context. They don't struggle to make their voices heard. The established institutions, the people who are happy with them, are the people that those institutions serve effectively. The ones who aren't happy, who can't work through those institutions, are the ones where the collective action comes from. Okay, So, it is almost by definition outside established institutions because if it wasn't outside, well, then it's working through the existing institutions of society and there are existing ways to influence uh, policy, to influence um, uh, implementation of policy, etc. Okay, it's the people who can't afford the lawyers in one sense. Um, Revolution is a far more, a far less predictable and a far more um, contested area. Uh, some theorists go so far as to say it's it's when there are multiple sovereignties, multiple, you know, not just two opposing positions, but two or more opposing positions where they are are 
contesting absolute authority over society, um, that they really are the true representatives. Okay, And that's, again, uh, another thing that you're going to see, there are cycles of contention, that it's not just something that happens, it's not one movement, it's it's a slow, over time build. Um, yeah, that doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily, or it's very unusually actually, the outcome of collective action. Collective action normally uh, is responded to by formal institutions, which then adapt and change the context. Um, and then, you know, there are periods of lull and then periods of emergence of collective action again as change goes on. All right. Okay. Now, I want you to think, what conditions do you think give rise to collective action? And there's dissatisfaction in every society. There's poverty, there's inequality. But what makes people join together to collectively take action? to collectively strike, to collectively march, to um, occupy a building. Okay, I want some suggestions. Yeah, Manda. Nothing. <laughs> Is it too early in the morning? Okay, you've read the readings. The, the Giddens and Dunier talks about possible areas, okay? Um, or they start off and they, they look at um, common ways of, of explaining why collective action takes place. Uh, the tarot does something similar, um, except I like the tarot because he puts it into the existing um, almost uh, themes of sociology that you've already covered, right? He says, uh, look, it can be Giddens, uh, sorry, not Giddens, um, Durkheim. Uh, there is, and it's not what we're going to discuss in this course, but from a Durkheimian point of view, you might say that collective action happens because people are trying to establish a sense of community and um, identity, right, in a world that's changing and a world that um, has, that leaves us more uh, anomic, um, an anomic? Uh, with greater levels of enemy, okay, and that Collective action would be a way to to give some sense of community and identity. Right. Uh, Marx would have a different explanation for collective action. Uh, if anyone's doing psychology, and I'm sure that you are, you've already encountered. Uh, I think you've already encountered, or you certainly will, um, more social psychological explanations. Um, I think yes. from, hi, I think from what I read about Marx, it's when there's like a change in the base in the in the what is it called an economic yes um, yes that's when there's like a like a social um, yeah co mm. yeah collection or revolution. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, Gabrielle, thanks thanks for that. Um, yeah, Marx looks at at the economic sphere and he's saying that that the way the base of society that is the economic production, the way that a society produces and feeds itself um, has these fundamental contradictions that is based on, on um, an inequality of domination in capitalism, the control of the means of production. And it's, well, in capitalism, the absolute control of the means of production uh, previous uh, epochs had control of means of production, but not to the extent of capitalism. And that 
that fundamental structure of society means that there is this uh, perpetual contradiction, perpetual tension between the owners of the means of production and those who don't own but must work in order to live um, and must be employed in order to access the means of production that they can then feed themselves from. Uh, they can't eat their possibility of laboring. All right. They have to actually um, be able to match their labor to something out there. All right. Um, that looks at more structural factors than, for example, your crowd psychology. It also looks at uh, that Marxist um, approach will also look at the inevitability of it. Right? But we'll come to that in a moment. Um, can I have a show of hands? Crowd psychology. Who's familiar with that explanation? Okay, you've been at home too long. Um, try to get, I, I know that, that it's expensive to travel and that you've you've organized your lives so you perhaps cannot come out but um be very careful about just getting into a into a rut where where you don't want to interact with people it's fun to interact all right um spoken from someone who doesn't like interacting it's great being back in class okay crowd psychology crowd psychology is a more psychological um well, no, actually, that's an insult to psychology. It, it has its, its history, its origins in the fear of the crowd. So uh, more privileged um, structures of society or more privileged people in society uh, see this crowd as being um, a danger to them. It is a danger to them. Uh, it is a, a mass of people who threaten them because they want to change things. They see that crowd as, as irrational. They don't see it as having um, particular aims and uh, logic, you know, rational reasons as to why people are marching. They see it as a, a terrifying thing that happens from the mass rabble out there. All right. Uh, they look at it as individual things. They're not seeing it as part of the structure of society. They're not seeing it as something that is inevitable. They're seeing it as as people who who in the emotion of this crowd, in being whipped up by leaders or rhetoric or whatever, are losing their sense of rationality, are losing their self control. Um, that they become irrational and do terrible things in crowds because of almost like a contagion, right? There's a crowd and people next door uh, get equally emotional about it and hit up and join the crowd, okay? Um, there are more, uh, people have looked at that and said, look, actually, if you think about it, uh, crowd behavior and yes, we can we can identify when crowds do terrible things like lynchings. Yes, that is a case of people doing things that they hopefully would never think of doing outside. OK, that it is in the moment that it happens. But there's a large amount of, of very rational, self-interested behavior in that, that uh, we saw in the riots last year, that you see a crowd and you see an opportunity. You see a way to to act in your own interest um, without being identified uh, in that action. For example, the person who, um, well, the people who weren't part of the looting, but used that opportunity to, you know, help themselves to things. Uh, that was very rational. All right. If you're going to do something, the crowd is is a very good way of um, cloaking, uh, remaining anonymous in this. Okay. Um, when we start to to say, well, perhaps there's a lot more rational understanding of this, then we go on to saying, okay, 
we're looking more to the grievance theory and the economic deprivation. Uh, on the one hand, you have, yeah, and, and this again, these are, are explanations of collective action that have different strands, different ideologies within them. So the grievance theory and economic deprivation, you have the Marxists on the one side, right? That's typically um, their position, okay, that it's built into the structure. But you also have the, the individualists, the, the rational behaviorists who say, um, well, it happens when you consider the, the uh, likely benefits of collective action, you know, that you will get um, a response, you will get rewards from the collective action, that is worth the cost of actually joining in that, that rather than sit at home, you decide that the cost um, of joining the action is worth it because you are so convinced that you will get an outcome. And then, of course, they say, well, this brings an even bigger problem of why do people join? Why don't they stay at home? I mean, the strike is happening. The, the protest is going on. People are there. Why do they also join? Okay especially when they're not assured of the outcome and, and the cost is often quite big, right? So they're looking at that and saying, well, even in that sense of deprivation, why do people, why are people sparked? And one of the things is that unlike, well, in, in, um, uh, in question of Marxism, they say it's not deprivation, it's relative deprivation that, uh, very poor people, um, situations of extreme deprivation, often there's no response. Often people become resigned to it. Uh, but in situations of uh, inequality, when inequality is, is so in your face, when it's um, When you're living side by side, very wealthy people, and you're living in terrible circumstances, you are constantly seeing the the degree that you are deprived relative to other people. And it forces you to question, well, why? How come it's unfair? All right. How come those people are not me uh, at work when you know that a colleague earns more than you do for the same work? All right. You're going to be really upset when that happens. This relative deprivation will then drive um, collective action, they say, far more than just deprivation. Uh, Marxist theory would say it's inbuilt in your society, it's going to happen, it's inevitable. When it doesn't happen, Marxism says um, false consciousness, uh, a lack of maturity of the working class. Okay? Both of these are saying economic deprivation, grievances. Yeah. And they're saying, okay, but how do we then explain why it doesn't happen sometimes? Why are there points where it doesn't happen? Uh, the, uh, the, rational the rational behaviorists are saying, um, uh, well, the rational action people are saying it's when the cost is too high relative to the to the outcome or where there isn't um, enough promise of a of a definite uh, reward so you know the risk of of being involved in the collective action is too big marxists are saying well it's because of false consciousness it's because the working class is not yet you know capitalism isn't yet firmly established in this society so from there, we have the next ones. In response to these problems, you have the groups that say, OK, well, actually, it might be a problem of leadership and resource mobilization when, despite unpleasant circumstances and deprivation, uh, protest action doesn't happen. Maybe it doesn't happen because there isn't effective leadership. There you have Lenin and the argument of the vanguard class, the vanguard who must, um, well, not really the vanguard class, the vanguard who, who must lead the working class and uh, conscientize and um, mobilize, all right? Uh, 
around Marx's ideology, um, spread the ideology, the understanding, in order to uh, enable that working class to sustain collective action in opposition to capitalism and to achieve a revolution. Um, the rational action people would say, well, it's leadership, yes, but it's also the resources that are there that what kind of resources are these people mobilizing? And think of resources in quite a broad way that is not necessarily, um, yes, it's material resources of finance to bus people in, right, to print pamphlets perhaps, or not these days though, um, but also resource mobilization in terms of symbolic um, resources that that bind people together, that mobilize people. Uh, struggle songs. Okay? Struggle songs would be a, a very powerful resource to use in mobilizing action. They uh, Struggle songs have behind them the legitimacy of the anti-apartheid movement. They also have the, the um, victory of, of success, right? And they have that collective spirit of of um music a collective where everyone knows the words uh that is incredibly powerful in giving people a sense of unity and a sense of of purpose all right you could think of resource mobilization as ideology like that lenin and his vanguard um uh sect or not sector vanguard uh, aspect that understands and um spreads that ideology, that understanding of who's who, what the problem is, and why are they our enemies, why are those our alliances. All right. So think of resources in a more um in a broader sense than just material resources. But we'll carry on that'll come up more in, in future slides. Okay. Uh I mean for example the the, the rational um action people say how say it's 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 a fundamental problem but how to under, how to understand why individuals join collective actions when it's not in their individual interests individually if there is already a crowd they don't need to join all right they're going to benefit from it anyway so the fact they see people as individual uh individually orientated rather than collective so for them to explain this collective uh, behavior is is a challenge right. uh, and then you have another well not another but leading on from that uh, a deeper look into into the way that people understand their lives and the values they have and the expectations they have uh, and here probably the most influential person would be Gramsci right who looks at uh, the working well, he looks at the situation and he says, look, what you have is uh, cultural hegemony. You have such a fundamental, thoroughgoing acceptance of the way things are, that this is the way society operates, that competition is intrinsic to human beings. This is instinctual for us. Um, and that to think of anything outside is just ridiculous. This is the way that it is because this is the the only way that it actually does work, right? And Gramsci pointed out that you have to do a hell of a lot more than just uh, rally up the working class in, in order to challenge that. The working class has, you know, they exist outside of work. Um, they watch movies, they read books, they read newspapers, they are exposed to the broader ideology. They don't just exist in, by themselves. You have to challenge that that um, that common sense understanding of the world, right? He says pretty much what you're trying to build is counter hegemonic resistance, counter uh, to counter the very um, the base values that explain the way the world works as being legitimate. This cultural framing is part of resource mobilization. It just brings that, you know, it's a more concerted um, cultural 
so it adds to the 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 economic deprivation, sorry, the, the resource mobilization and brings a, a much more um, interesting dimension to it. Okay. Okay. All right. Any questions there before we go on? Another question, but mm -hmm. uh, in response to this, uh, select, uh, what is it, selectivism that we that the new generation is now having, where we just hashtag things and we don't go out in the street and actually do something about them. I would, um, you know, like it's interesting to see how these theories would, you know, would be developed in like the next five or 10 years when, when I think really we would, I think like selectivism would be at its peak where we literally don't go out of the house and we just hashtag it and then we've done our part. <laughs> But then you know, like you know, like um, you know, like then it brings the question: What have we actually done besides you know hashtag yeah. interact with our social media? Yeah, I, and how can you then understand hashtag? I mean, it is it's it's um, there's something collective about it. It's seeing a collective, knowing that that the and it's it's telling people that you know it's more than just you who believes this. There are other people out there, so. It's doing something collective, but is it as as valuable? It's you could almost say it is doing an element of resource mobilization, but if it's not doing anything more than that, how can it? Um, yeah, is that enough? Right. One of the key. Yeah. 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 One of the key things with collective action is that it is that action that mobilizes support. All right, so you've got to mobilize support to have the action. But once you have the action out there, that itself mobilizes because it's it's bringing it to people's, um, it's making it visible. So your collective, your, your hashtag makes it visible, but doesn't take it past that. You know, and, and also hashtag, you can't put ideology into a hashtag, right? So Yes, it tends to be issue based. Okay, that's interesting. Anyone else? Okay, but that, for example, is is one of the the example um, a way that you can see how technology has so fundamentally uh, shaped the way that we do interact um, and the possibilities for collective action. What we can do, what and what that means, you know, is it going to be as effective? Right. So Tilly is is a very important theorist in the the social movement understanding generally, um, and he says, well, there are several aspects to um, Sorry, um, there's several aspects to successful action, to whether or not um, an episode of collective action becomes something more sustained, uh, whether that episode could ever become something uh, like a revolution, right? And he says, first of all, you have to look at the organization. And this is, again, very dependent on the context in which you're operating. Uh, in some situations, a devolved hierarchy, um, that dispersed character of, of um, for example, in anti-apartheid movements in South Africa, that was essential. Without that dispersed and decentralized organization, those movements wouldn't have been able to survive. Uh, on the other hand, um, there's arguments around um, the the effect of bureaucracy on social movements that actually weak bureaucracies, bureaucracies that, that aren't good at, at actually achieving anything, uh, tend to diminish, reduce uh, social action in societies where the bureaucracy is useless. It's the likelihood of getting anything done in some societies is seen as like zero, so why bother to engage in collective action. Um, you know, you may win, but 
your gains will never be implemented. On the other hand, there are um, studies which show, well, actually no, because having a weak bureaucracy means that there are many points of attack um, that if you can influence the education system, okay, or um, uh, one tiny part of, you know, home affairs, for example, um, then it has an impact on the rest of it. And you don't have the, it's not, the other institutions don't rush to the, to the defense of home affairs, all right? It's like the authority is scattered, so it gives you more opportunities to enter and challenge. All right, so that organization, we're not saying it has to be one one kind of organization. It's, it's dependent on the circumstances, all right? And again, this is probably why it's, it's very difficult to see in the future, but looking back, you can see, you know, oh, that was successful because, which kind of challenges um, sociology research generally because it is, you know, looking back, it's easy to say, can you use it to predict the future? Uh, Tilly also says, okay, also mobilization, the way that people, the way that groups mobilize, if there is an existing, um, if there are existing resources, like in South Africa, we have a history of collective action or struggle. Those are resources that are sitting there that people can then draw on to use, like struggle songs. Okay. Um, it might be a case of existing public sympathy. Uh, for example, during COVID, there might have been uh, I want to say there might have been more sympathy for basic income grant, but okay, maybe there was some sympathy for basic income grant that, but yeah, it certainly didn't become part of a social movement or collective action of any sort. Uh, but yeah, your context shapes, and these are things which they, yeah, they quite often quite happenstance. Right, they they are uh, things that have an enormous impact, but you uh, they couldn't have been predicted, like COVID. Okay, uh, and that's where he says the opportunity, those chance events that are that provide opportunities for contentious or revolutionary action. Uh, the July riots, you could say, well, if it wasn't for COVID. Um, those people would have been working. They would have been at school or at university. Uh, if it wasn't for COVID, the police would have been more active in uh, dealing with crowds. They would have been more aware of what was happening, of the undercurrents. Okay. Uh, okay. And that issue of common interest, that is very important. Uh, that And this is, again, one of the, the importance where it comes to ideology, that to identify common interests, uh, and that often means um, articulating a problem in a way that includes other people's ideas, other groupings' ideas. Uh, so, um, uh, let's see, there, there's plenty of fodder um, for the fire. Uh, you just you got to connect those groupings. Um, it's like the ANC is a broad church, they say, because it had to be, it had to accept um, very different organizations, uh, Communist Party, um, trade unions, workerist organizations, um, black bourgeoisie who had their land expropriated, right? Those are different interest groups different interest groups that in some circumstances would be seen as fundamentally opposed to each other. The ANC, by being that broad church, managed to rally them around that, um, that one focus of racial inequality, right, of liberation. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't force anyone to have to give up their, their other beliefs, right? And that sense of a common interest and strategic alliances with um, 
you know, like the EFF is doing around uh, uh, xenophobia. Okay, very strategic. This is where this is this is it has public support. It has public resonance. All right, it's going to win you followers if you associate like that. If you associate with those groupings, it's kindling for the fire that you you just need to gather it up. All right. Okay. All right. Can anyone tell us? Can you think of examples? Anyone want to contribute? Okay, you can write in the in the meeting chat if you want, rather. Okay. Um, just for those people who, who arrived late, if I'm carrying on about something that you already understand and I'm going on and on, it's because I don't know that you understand. So when you do, um, a thumbs up really helps. Uh, and then I know that you understand. Um, hand up and I will ask you. Um, but also, you know, there, there are few of us here, and I don't see how many people there are, but I think they went to four, five, seven people. Okay, so there are few of us here that really interrupting is not going to create a problem. So, you know, if you have a question, ah, Mandla, thank you. Operation Dudula, yes, very definitely looks at existing situation, particularly in COVID. That that real desperation that people have, and and that sense of 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 being 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 your citizenship rights are not seen as giving you anything. So uh, the liberation of South Africa was the liberation to actually identify and to recognise that we are all citizens. Citizens share in the wealth of a country. Operation Dadula is saying the problem is these people from outside are taking our resources. Okay. So rather than attending to, and someone in the live class said last week, well, it's easy to, to well, it's not easy, but given our history, people mobilize quite quickly and have less problem um, uh, challenging other black people than they do challenging white people. Uh, we used to live in an area of um, KZN where it was KZN and right next to us, literally, we were on the junction of uh, what used to be the Bantustan KwaZulu. And then there was an, an Indian area also jutting into that. and. Um, in the early 2000s uh, around land reform, land invasions started, but the land invasions only happened on the Indian land because the the story was, or the belief was, or the, the reasoning went that the white people had title deeds so that they couldn't invade that land, but the Indian people didn't have title deeds. All right, so it's, yeah. It's perhaps given our, our uh, past, it's more likely that foreigners, black foreigners are attacked rather than um, white people controlling resources who are also South African citizens. Uh, Operation Dadula is also, you know, I, it's it's right to to use as a as a rallying call against capitalism that is I think particularly um, uh, unpleasant because it is saying we challenging foreigners because they are the most exploited. Um, you know, um, capitalists because they are willing to work for so little, they are uh, perpetuating the extreme exploitation of capitalism. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it, it's just quite tragic to think of it like that because then you're attacking the the people who are worst off, you know, um, attack those who are employing them. Uh, but anyway, 
its operation to do that is something that that takes existing sentiment and shapes it into something and says, ha, ah, this is why you're poor, right? And shapes it around something that has resonance. I and mean, all over the world, we find that um, sense of nationalism, nationalism is a growing threat throughout the world. Um, yeah, and it does tend to be in situations of uncertainty, people people go down to their to their identity and they enclose themselves and see the stranger outside as the threat. And the stranger is always a scapegoat. Okay, um, the killing of Jewish people in Europe uh, regularly. You know, when anything bad happened, um, every couple of decades, uh, yeah, they'd round up the Jewish people and kill them because that was that was a scapegoat. That was the stranger because they did things differently, because they went to religious organization or religious practices in a different place at a different time, all right? Wore their hair differently. Oh, sorry. I have a cat on my lap who might attack at any moment. All right, so. Okay, don't worry, we're coming up to a break. Uh, this is from both Tarot and Giddens, but I think Tarot is a better a better reading um, for this. This is another way of of explaining why action takes place. That yes, there's all of this in in a society. There's all of this unhappiness or whatever or needs not being met, and it is the the nature of the political structure that provides opportunities for people to see, ah, we can protest there. Whether that opportunity is um, a shift in power forces, uh, maybe one of your uh, key parties um, is, uh, you know, maybe a leader is killed in which case it, it destabilizes the existing power forces. Um, maybe um, particular organs of state, like for example, home affairs, is seen as uh, having or being uh, more open, more susceptible to uh, the interests of one group rather than another group. Um, one of the examples that Taro gives is uh, the American uh, political system, how because they have, because religion is so clearly separated from state, okay, that separation between state and, 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 um, and politics and po state and religion has been so, so thoroughgoing, it means that religious organizations provide very safe spaces for resistance, for people to mobilize in, for organizations to emerge from, because they, they're hidden from the state, because the state won't intervene within religious organizations, okay? Um, and also, I mean, what, they, what that opportunity is, 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 is then, looks to is saying, um, you know, what is the opportunity and what is the threat? Uh, for example, the July riots, the opportunity was there. What was the threat of retaliation by the police? Were the police there? Was the army there? Were the army somewhere else? Um, was this known about? All right. So it is that kind of, there's an opportunity um, to put forward your claim, but there's also um, the likelihood of opposition. You know, if the if the threat of police action against you is very very slim, is very unlikely, uh, then that's an opportunity. You have less less expectation of repression, so people are more able to mobilise because there's yeah, it's opportunity and threat. Um, Tara goes on, uh, and in his approach, he says, "How about we look at this as a process?" So it's a process of people mobilizing, people, you know, collective action happening, 
But then also there's a response from existing formal structures. Uh, they respond to this. Um, strike action happens and they respond. Um, particular ways of, of negotiation are established to provide an ordered way of getting those voices and, and demands transmitted up. So you have a, a decline in collective action um, in this organized of people who don't have structures because you're saying, yes, you have a, um, a legitimate concern. This is how we're going to interact with you and we're going to continue to listen to what you say through these structures. Okay. Um, so you have to see it not only in terms of of changes in politics, you know, it's not just changes in the political system that people are looking out for. Uh, it's also the political system then responding um, to what's happening in society. And their response changes that field of operation. OK, um, so the political process approach, which uh, McAdam looks at, he says it's a continual process of emergence um, response, decline, emergence, uh, as, you know, over time, once again, that, that thing of the context is, is crucial, that as time moves on, um, you, the, the lay of the land is changing, right? Movements uh, that might be very active today, they may collapse, but they might have established um, resources that future groups can use, future mobilizations can use, uh, to their advantage, all right? So, McCannon says, okay, so it's, he says there are three factors. First of all, it's your structure of political opportunities, those resources external to the group. Um, and here, uh, oh, sorry, hang on, let's go back. All right, McAdam, what he, what he's, uh, Basing what he what he what his research is based on is the the um, it's called the summer of freedom I think uh, I'm gonna have it written down somewhere here huh I don't I think it's called the summer of freedom in 1960 uh, where there was a a mobilization of uh, activists and particularly students from the northern states of America to go to the south uh, and join with the civil rights movement to help the um, registration of voters, uh, particularly black voters, and to ensure that elections took place in a more equal way. And they wanted these students um, to, to go there and do this this work, but they also knew that they were going to become part of a of a of an incident of a reaction. Okay, so they also uh, they when they interviewed people who wanted to become part of this, they they did through these extensive interviews, um, and they would say yes, you can come, or no, you can't come. And some of the people who they said yes, you can come, didn't come. So there's this wealth of, of data out there about, uh, you know, the, the application forms were very long and they were asked all sorts of questions. One of the questions that they were asked is, um, who should know about their well-being when they are involved in this thing? You know, if we haven't heard from you for a day or two, who should we be calling? And the people that they put down were things like, um, if you knew anyone in government, I mean, if your uncle uh, or you know, if your uncle was someone, a senator in government, then tell my uncle because he will pressure the the authorities. Um, tell this particular person. So it was identifying people within uh, political structures, existing political structures that that could be mobilized to get resources to put pressure on the government from within the government, okay? It wasn't resources that they had. The senators weren't marching. They weren't going along and making sure that the voting was happening, but you could use them if you if you established that link, okay? 
So, uh, right. The next two he looked at was uh, the strength of indigenous organization. When you have a history of organization in a in a society, um, that is always uh, it's fertile um, for future organized action, for future collective action. Uh, both in terms of the accepted and the legitimate ways of protesting. Uh, so there's some, yeah, and, and this is also quite culturally specific, um, that uh, people tend to, to protest in common ways over time. Uh, I think Giddens gives the example of, of the French, the French stop traffic. They bring um, they bring their tractors. It's, it's it's generally the French farmers who are protesting. Um, they a powerful force, and they bring their tractors into into France and block the roads. Um, we have yes, we've had uh, trucks that blocking our national roads. That has happened in South Africa, but more common for us is marches and sit-ins. Um, rioting is uncommon. Yeah, writing, uh, yeah, sorry, not writing, looting. Looting, uh, looting foreigners' shops is common, all right? So, but that's xenophobia. Um, you know, they xenophobic movements that then say those those foreigners, it's, it's not legitimate, we can loot those stores. But looting other stores is not generally something that happens. And I think that's one of the reasons why there was such a, a shocked and and outraged um, response from many many circles of of society uh, when that happened last year. Um, all right, uh, what else do we have there? And very importantly, yeah, the cognitive liberation. You know, it's cognitive liberation, the belief that, that you can change the circumstance. Yes, it's important. Um, but we can also think of that cognitive liberation in terms of the kinds of opportunities that you see. Because the political opportunities, they, all you have, to, what, what you need is people to perceive opportunities. You know, if people think that the government is weak, they will be more likely to uh, take action to challenge the government, uh, which itself, if there are enough groups in society doing that, will make the government weak. But the perception of opportunity sometimes creates the opportunity itself. So that's another way that that, you know, that aspect of cognitive liberation uh, is an important factor. And here you have uh, Tarot's argument around cycles of contention. Uh, he's saying, look at the broader context. This is not just a moment isolated in time. It has a past, it has a future. Uh, because an organization or a movement has declined in significance at the moment doesn't, doesn't mean that it's all over, all right? It doesn't mean that the gains that that movement secured are, are lost forever. No, the gains are there, they just have to be brought up again. Roe versus Wade doesn't, uh, doesn't destroy the the women's rights movement, yeah. or the overturn of it. Okay, so Taro looks at at all of these different ways of explaining uh, collective organisation and explaining why some works and others do don't. Um, and he says, okay, let's take all of this together. And he says the important things that he thinks, yes. Political opportunities and constraints, he says, undoubtedly, that is very powerful um, with the proviso that 
it's as much perception of opportunities and constraints as it is reality of opportunities and constraints. Uh, and also, yes, the way that authorities respond does shape the kind of action that takes place. If authorities, well, if authorities respond to address the problem and to open negotiations, that tends to reduce uh, outside collective action because you've established an, an institutional pathway, you know, a, a regularized, um, controlled way to interact. Uh, when authorities respond by killing people, that tends to to create more problems. That tends to to uh, mobilise even more social um, collective action against government than uh, would be there if the government hadn't. Like, for example, Marikana. Okay. Uh, and Tara says, let's look at those resources as repertoires of contention, uh, a repertoire. A script, OK, um, a regular, a recognized way of doing things uh, that exist for other groups in society to to use. All right. Um, students march. Workers march, political organizations in South Africa march, the French farmers bring their tractors in. Uh, there are accepted ways of mobilizing people that are then drawn on in future movements. Uh, what's more, you have those cycles of contention that there will be periods in society where there is very little collective action, very little. Um, vibrant um, opposition, very little space for, for other voices. But at other times, things change. So other groups see that there are possible ways of organizing. Um, perhaps uh, solidarity as a trade union and how they are trying to become uh, more more useful to their to their members. They are trying to become uh, slightly, you know, less less isolated. They're trying to align with other union structures um, because that that exists out there, and they're not using it uh, without that. Okay, so their repertoires of contention, they're seeing other things happening, they're seeing the possibilities of winning gains if you join that. So perhaps they um, are then looking for ways to organize or get involved. All right. Uh, cultural frames. Cultural frames are, I think it's, it's, absolutely crucial it 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 provides the reasoning for your action uh it legitimizes um you know it's not just people protesting because they don't want to pay fees there's a there's a story behind it there's an argument behind it that frames it in a way that makes it understandable and garners sympathy uh, for example, saying, you know, um, there's, yes, they're very poor people uh, and there's financial aid for those people, but what about the missing middle? Okay, that resonates with, with middle class people in Joburg. It resonates with our urban population. It resonates with uh, government. Okay, that way of framing something, um, framing... Um, no, I mean, using xenophobia to frame action, it's taking a problem of, of inequality and saying this is the reason why it's shaping it. OK. Is this class class going to be saved? Yes, indeed, we are taping it. All right. And the last point before we're going to have a break shortly. Um, and Tara here is drawing is drawing from Mac Adam in highlighting the importance of networks 
All right. And think of networks once again, if you go back to anti-apartheid anti movements, those decentralized um, groupings, what you need to have a large group is often very difficult to control. It takes many resources. Um, it's not practical and it's difficult. Uh, if you can establish connections with many different smaller groups, that in fact is, is much more powerful because you have those groups, their members who then come out in support of yourself. Uh, being entrenched in those networks has an exponential effect on the power that you can exert. And of course, the likelihood that, that people will be mobilized uh, with the American South, the, the Freedom Summer. Um, they found that the people who, who, who were statistically significantly more likely to attend uh, this, this action were those who, who were involved in networks that had links to civil rights movements, all right? So it wasn't a case of, of people who had um, a family history of political action necessarily. It wasn't people who had um, uh, strong Marxist views. It wasn't people who uh, were deeply committed. Okay? There were people who were deeply committed who didn't turn up. It was that, that enmeshment within networks. Um, and one of the arguments is that that it, there were so many, you know, the more networks you involved and the more people, the more um, the more impact your actions have, uh, both for the future of your life. You know, if you tell everyone that you're going to join this um, and uh, you're involved in a number of different groups and they all get to know this and then you don't go, it has an enormous impact on well your personal future and relevance, um, but also on on you know the strength of those networks. Okay. All right. So last thing is two quotes from Tarot, which this is the point that I made earlier around Tarot having a much more rigorous. Uh, uh, criteria, more rigorous set of criteria for actually um, identifying social movements. He wants them to have, uh, he says, they've got to be um, not only uh, drawing on culturally resonant and powerful uh, repertoires, but also well enmeshed in the existing networks of collective action bodies in society. Okay, so we're going to take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and finish off looking at Weber and bureaucracy. Okay, I'm going to pause the recording. Uh, does anyone want to want to ask any questions before we do that? Okay, I'm going to pause the recording. Can someone uh, who's coming back, Gabrielle, are you able to attend the second part? Are you coming back in 10 minutes? Yeah, I'll be back in 10 minutes. Brilliant. Okay. Can you remind me to please start recording again? Because I'm going to pause the recording. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. OK, take a, a 10 minute break. So let's say we are back at uh, just before 25-2. OK, how about we say 25-2? OK, at 25-2 we, we come back.
Okay. Um, all right. I have. We are still recording. Uh, my watch is slower than I thought. Um, okay, but everyone's back, I assume. All right, so to move on to Weber, uh, and in terms of your assignment topic, uh, this is one of the the ways that that you can, uh, if you wanted to argue that unions are no longer um, relevant in South Africa, you might be asking, yes, I am still recording, thank you. Um, you might be asking, well, perhaps they've become bureaucratic and as bureaucracies they've become uh, unable to respond to the concerns of their members, to be unable to uh, continue to represent, right? Um, it starts from the position that you assume an organization, a social movement that is successful grows in size. If a social movement grows in size, uh, you have to have bureaucracy. That's the argument. Okay, so uh, it's a good place to start to see, to think of Weber's understanding of authority, uh, to see how distinctly he sees bureaucracy, all right? Now, in his grand theory of, of how the world works, uh, he sees three different forms of authority. Now, they are he argues that at different times in our lives, well, not our lives, but different times, different centuries, different worlds, um, different kinds of authorities dominate. But you will find usually, certainly today, all three forms of authority still active in any society, virtually. Okay. That that would be traditional authority. Traditional authority, it's authority that you have as as a, as an established way things are. So, for example, you are born into a position of authority, and you have that authority because people have always given authority to that particular class or status of being born into that role. Um, it's looking back to to the past, but it's also maintaining that that connection with the past so that it's reproducing and existing and almost the 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 basis for legitimacy is that it used to be like this. This is the way that it was, this is the way that it is and how it will always be. Okay. Charismatic authority, that's great figures, yeah? uh, where you are able to, yeah, where, where it is your personal qualities that are the reason why people accept your authority and why you have such an authoritative impact on people, why you are believed, why you are um, considered legitimate, uh, a rightful, a proper exercise of authority is because of who you are, all right? So you can think of people like um, Zuma, okay? Uh, he had uh, a different type of authority, a different basis of authority when he was president. He had the third form, that legal, rational authority, uh, but he continues to have authority you could argue based on his, you know, as a result of his charisma, um, religious leaders, charisma. Okay. Um, okay. Faber argues that in modern society, simply because of the complexity of interactions, uh, the complexity of organizations are uh, the diverse functions that are happening and that need to to be able to 
the need to to be an authority to control that situation requires a much more abstract more abstract but more less contested kind of authority okay you can imagine charismatic authority one charismatic leader challenges another um, traditional authority no not very challengeable um, except by the opposing country perhaps um, legal rational it's saying there are many differences in this society we can't uh, Gabrielle yes um, your slide uh, we, uh, I'm like we're still only seeing traditional authority you haven't um, uh, yeah okay let's go back one are you now seeing it no not yet Huh. Oh, wait, maybe it's just me. I don't know. Other people, it's unlikely it's just you. Uh -uh. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, I have a way around this. Well, actually, no, I don't. Um, still not seeing. No. Yeah. Try moving okay. to the next slide. Maybe it will. Yeah. Uh -uh. Okay, I will um, change it on the other point. I'll just amend the slide. Okay. Yeah. Right. Oh, I see it. I think maybe it's because I had gone ahead and then came back and I wasn't in sync with you. <laughs> I think everyone else is in sync. I'm not sure. Sorry for that. Okay. Does everyone else, can I have at least one other person? They've all gone to the toilet and got locked in there. My okay. slides have always been sociology catch up week one and two. Nothing has been changing since we started. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and I think I just, I was like, oh, I don't know if I should ask if there's a slide yeah. presented on there or not. So, because everyone was kite, yeah. I just assumed we're just going to listen to you without okay. the slides going forward. Right. Yeah. Okay, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop all of the, all of the animations and I'll then stop sharing and reload the one without any animations. Hopefully that works. Okay. No cash. Okay, stop sharing. Okay. Right, so we stopped sharing and then let's share again the other one.
Okay, is anyone seeing anything yet? Ah, thank you. Okay. All right, are you seeing Weber different forms of legitimate authority yet? Brilliant. <laughs> okay, okay. There we go. Right. So, legal rational authority uh, stands back and says, okay, there, there's, there are different ideas, there are different needs, there are different beliefs in this very complex society. Uh, what we're going to do is agree on a process uh, of identifying authority. Okay. So it is uh, it's a legal and rational way. Um, rational when Weber talks about rationality, and there, there's yeah a lot of uh, writing around this. He's not. He's meaning that there's a that there's a set of reasons for doing things in a way in a particular way. He's not saying that those are that it's the best way to do something. He's not saying that it's the most efficient way. He's saying that it's rational and in that you can clearly see why it's an acceptable or a possible or a real uh, uh, a likely means to an end. It's the means to an end thing, All right? So the most, um, the best way to, deliver mass education is to uh, concentrate children into schools where there are a number of different classrooms and teachers, okay? And the teachers have authority over this area and that, and the next higher up, um, the, the head of department has authority over the subject and the uh, principal over the broader school. That, this is the way that hierarchy, that that um, authority is structured, in order to most effectively achieve the end. Okay, and even I want to say, yeah, most effectively. Uh, Weber says he's not saying most effectively. Weber says all he's saying is that you can clearly explain to someone why it is done like this, and you'll explain in a means to end that in order to best or in order to uh, provide mass education at the lowest financial cost, uh, this is the way that it is done. Okay, there are reasons that you can argue. Okay, you can go back and argue the reasons, but you can argue them unlike charismatic and uh, traditional authority when the reason is unarguable. the The person is charismatic. Okay. Uh, the traditional authority, it was like that in the past, is not open to any sorts of contestation. Uh, this is also related to, I mean, it's common, Weber sees it as more common in modern society, and it's also related to, to a, a very modern, um, modern values of of progress and knowledge that whereas before, okay, in the story, before Copernicus and his telescope, right, uh, that showed that the earth was revolving around the sun rather than the sun around the earth, okay, that was a big thing for the, for the church not because of the idea. The idea had always been there, but it was because it was proved. Okay. Uh, before, before the Enlightenment, okay, what the Enlightenment did was say, no, in fact, there is one we can know about this world. We can only know about this world, all right? And we know about it through 
observation, through empirical observation, through experimentation. Rather than have a situation where the knowledge that you got from God uh, was viewed as equivalent, was seen as, yes, you have knowledge through rational argument. You have the philosophers, you have the mathematicians. You also have knowledge through a higher being. It's received, it was called received knowledge, okay? And those were seen to be equally valid, all right? Copernicus caused a big outcry, not because he had the idea. No, the idea had always been there and the church didn't have a problem with it. The problem was that he could he could prove it physically. He could use that telescope to actually show. You could see it, all right? It was observable. So it denied the other story, okay? So with that enlightenment, there was a split in the way that we thought that we could, in, in our attitude to what we can do, that in the physical world, uh, we can explain things. Uh, we explain through observation, through factual observation, through um, searching for something to, to uh, disprove a hypothesis. Uh, but that's all that we can do. We can't say anything about higher reaches. We can't say anything about what happens after death. We can't say anything about what is right, what is just. We can't say anything about how God wants us to operate or how we should operate. All we can say is that um, these, you know, um, gravity is a force. Uh, we can impose order on a society. Uh, we know how to do that. We don't know what the truth is, all right? So that whole idea of, of, of ultimate values of this is the best way that society should be, all right? Because church used to be a, a foundation of everything with that idea of, of there, was a, there was an absolute, there was the right way. And they had the knowledge of the right way um, that society should operate. With modernity and uh, the Renaissance and all of that, um, you had that split so that it was no, the church can talk about afterlife. They can talk about what should be up there. All right. But it's the scientists who actually operate with the physical material world and they operate through knowing and observing and testing and experimentation. OK. So this legal rational authority is on the basis of not being able to identify the absolute truth. We're not saying that this is fair, but we're saying that this is. Equal, right? that it's a means to an end, it's objective, it's not in order to privilege one person rather than another. Uh, it is not tied to personality, right? It's tied to your position um, in an organization, your position, your, your function, right? Not you as a person. Uh, so that Yes, if you are elected president, you have a sphere of authority. How you get elected is already um, regulated, okay, so that it's a process that happens like this all the time. It doesn't happen as, as people wish it. Uh, the, the lecturer has certain areas of authority but they only have the authority there. They don't have the authority when they're not teaching, okay? Everyone else out there doesn't have to listen to them. Um, it is authority that's tied to a particular position, okay? Uh, so, private organizations, businesses, are generally run with this kind of authority. You get a point, you get, you know, you apply for a job. The job says you will do this, this, and this. You have authority over those people. But when you leave the job, you don't continue to have authority over them. You know, when you go home at the end of the day, 
you can't insist that they cook you dinner, all right? They're no longer your underlings that you are managing, all right? It's an authority that is tied to a position rather than a person. And you can see how this fits with a more modern society. It's not, it's, it's highlighting, it's a move away from tradition and charismatic authority to something that is more equal, more achievable. So whereas with traditional authority, you are born into a position of authority, with legal rational authority, you, everyone, um, Everyone who gets into that position has the same authority. It's not different authority based on different people. So it's an equal, it's an achieved. You're not born into a position. You achieve a position. You get employed in the, in the job, okay, in that position. So what am I saying here? All right. So this legal rational authority. It's on the basis of, of rational means to an end. Not the best way, but there is, it's, that's the way that it's organized because you want to achieve that goal, all right? Not because you were told to do it like this by God. It is based on an equality of people so that if you get that position, you have that authority. You don't have it outside that position. Okay. You have rights as a basis, uh, as a result of, of your position, your um, being a citizen, you have certain rights. Okay. Uh, being a judge, you have certain rights. Being a policeman, you have certain rights. Um, it fits with the emergence of industrial society, with capitalism, which draws on values and, and ideologies of equality, individual equality, and achievement, yeah, achieved status rather than um, uh, uh, inherent status. Okay. This kind of status, or kind of authority at least, is fundamental to bureaucracy. It is an organization of tasks. Oh, hang on, Gabrielle. In other words, this is an expansion of Weber's social actions. Yes. Okay. It draws on the same thing, but whereas in social actions, you are looking at, at, at the reasons for doing something. Okay. Uh, within this, he's saying yes and extend that to authority. This is the, the reasons why we are accepting authority. I mean, look, we know that, that courts aren't objective, okay? We know incidences, many incidences where the courts are not objective, where the wrong person is prosecuted, where the person with money is the one who comes out and the person without money is the one who doesn't benefit, you know, doesn't get, get justice. But the principle that we give courts authority is that they will be equal. When it doesn't happen, we're furious. Okay. The reason why we consider it a legitimate authority is because it is rational and it is, um, you know, anyone in the position of judge has those rights and uh, the law is such that it's like this, and that applies equally to everyone. When it doesn't, we get really angry, okay? So our, our, we give it authority, we give it legitimacy because of that, okay? Yeah, you know, try and see, because you've learned a lot of little bits about Weber, try and see it as a whole because it's it's not like he then stops thinking about one thing he's still thinking about that he's just applying it to a new circumstance all right so this is the kind of authority that underlies bureaucracy it's based on a legal rational authority that the structure of uh it's a hierarchical authority and the structure of that hierarchy um is is derived from 
a means end analysis. Okay. The best means to achieve a particular end. It's not necessarily the best means, okay, but it's the best means that these people are thinking of. Okay? This is the way that they've decided. They've decided it because they see it leading from means to end. They haven't decided to do it like this because they got told in a dream one day. All right. And with that is a, a differentiation in tasks based on this, that, that uh, everyone has their own sphere of influence rather than uh, having to do everything or being able to make decisions over everything. Uh, it's based on specialization and training that you achieve this position as a bureaucrat based on your knowledge of the rules. Yeah. It's impersonal and objective application of these rules and processes. It's not different depending on who you are. And again, this is the principle. When it doesn't happen, we get upset. Okay. So this is the, the reason that we um, give authority to this. And Weber talks about the the insistence that bureaucrats say, no, no, we are not just um, machines. Uh, oh, someone has some one of one of the readings has a, a phrase of it's not a case of the judge having the legal statutes fed in here and the judgments coming out at the bottom. <laughs> OK, uh, it's a case of, yes, they are legal. Um, framework, there's there's the knowledge of the rules and all the rest of it and the laws, but there is that personal assessment. Okay. He's saying that's fine. It's the thing that yes, you're expected to have that personal um well, the judge is expected to make a decision to weigh up evidence, but it's assumed that they do it on a rational basis. So that, yes, your bureaucrats will insist that they don't operate just according to the rules, that they really do hear you, they really do see the single mother and the difficulty and blah, blah. And they do. But that's not the reason that they have authority. The reason they have the authority, legitimate authority, is because they have that position in, you know, they have authority over that tightly specified area. They have those qualifications. That's the reason why and where they are able to exercise authority. Okay. They don't have the authority because they are so sweet and nice. They have it because of a position. It gives them authority over a particular area. Okay. And another key characteristic of bureaucracy is record keeping. Um, now, when you read that Weber chapter, it's 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 very long, and um, yeah, Albright uh, will give you probably a, a better chance of of understanding it. Um, there are many things that he identifies around bureaucracy. Okay, what I've tried to do here by identifying five key characteristics is highlight the ones that are most commonly identified as key characteristics. Weber himself covers these, but doesn't necessarily um, do it in the way that I've done it here. You can contest this, okay? I'm just trying to give you a structure to work around. Uh, so, for example, hierarchy of authority. I regard that as authority attached to the office and position, not the person. So um, Weber's argument that uh, bureaucracy rests on, on a monetary economy, that you have to be able to pay in cash to the bureaucrat is part of this, because if you didn't pay him or her in cash, they would have to go out and find their own money. And he gives you the example of, of um, lords of a manor who would employ someone to collect taxes. And that person had the authority to collect taxes, the employment 
okay, the remuneration they got, the payment they got was that they took a percentage of what they collected, all right? So it was like your area of influence, you go and collect taxes and you take some of it and sometimes you take more of it that you should, but we turn a blind eye for that as long as the Lord of the manor gets the expected amount of tax, what you do with the rest of the money that you, or the produce that you um, demand is up to you, all right? That authority is going all over the place, okay? You are acting outside of uh, any defined sphere. It's very personal, it's, it's um, yeah. Uh, that I would regard as within that hierarchy of authority, it being tied to a position. I'm not mentioning here the the reliance on a cash wage uh, rather than a portion of the proceeds of taxes. Okay. Uh, so don't be terribly hit up if you don't like the way this is done, or if you'd rather have some point, in, you know, in some different way, go for it. Uh, give yourself some sort of a structure to understand it. Another thing that, that is very commonly highlighted is that a key characteristic of bureaucracy is administrative secrecy, that those rules and that specialized training is um, the way in which the authority of that bureaucracy is protected is maintained that you can't question um if you've ever visited a, a public hospital uh, you know the importance of the files that you move from one area to another and if you don't have the file there's a problem and only particular people can get you the file and uh yeah there are there are rules attached to who gets to know what and you don't get to ask why. Okay. The fact that they supposedly have this rational um, firm reasons for why things are done like that uh, is fine, but you can't question it. Okay. So it's like a it's an unquestionable authority in that. All right. That that administrative secrecy, that it's almost like gatekeeping that it becomes that specialized training and that record keeping that is is the the material the the power that they protect and that they guard and that they prevent any you know the outside people the clients the public from knowing you don't ask why something happens in some way it just this is the way it happens okay uh, Now, in terms of bureaucracy and democracy, uh, Weber is actually very, very critical in, in how he looks at this. He's not saying that bureaucracy is ideally suited to democracy. He's saying that it has, it is consistent because it's based on this equality. Right, this objective process. This um, every person is equal, so every person is treated equally in terms of the rules. Everyone has to fill out the form. Uh, anyone who has the qualifications can be employed in that position. Right. It emerged with democracy uh, as a challenge to uh, traditional authorities. But inevitably, it is almost because of its rationality that it's going to come into conflict with democracy. He says that very broad, um, well, the objective rationality of it is a process rationality. It's a process um, fairness that everyone must go through the same process, everyone must fulfill the same requirements, fill out the same form. It doesn't say anything about what should be, okay? It doesn't say anything about the substance. It's a procedural fairness rather than a substantial fairness. 
So if you don't have money for a brilliant lawyer, you will not have the same benefit of a legal system as someone who does have the money for a brilliant lawyer. Um, that isn't the case. You know, it, it's it's like that substance, your ability to actually benefit from equality. Okay. With bureaucracy, he's saying you can't, and this is because in a very complex society, the only way everyone has different needs, everyone has different values, you abstract to the position where you do have common acceptance, but all you have common acceptance over are the processes, all right? The actual content of, um, well, yes, I have access to a legal system, I'm treat, I'm equal before the law. But if I can't get to the court, then I'm not. That that is beside the, you know, the, the fact that I need money to get to the court or need money to employ the the lawyer is is beyond what the bureaucracy can do. They say no, that's that's questions of God. That's ultimate questions of ethics, questions of what should be. Okay. Whether it's fair or or yeah, whether you should materially have the means is a question that they can't answer. What they can apply equally and rationally, and that is defendability, you know, that this is the way it is because we're achieving that purpose. It's not because I woke up this morning and thought that I wanted to do this. Uh, that that is what they're able to do, right? They don't they're not able to to proclaim on substance of things. So that actually the mass of people, and Weber says, bureaucracy is not the friend of the masses. Bureaucracy is the friend of the people who are already able to work in the society, who already have the resources that bureaucracy assumes. To the, unpro I think he calls them the, the propertyless masses, he says, the propertyless masses are not served by the rational process of, of bureaucracy. Okay. Now, so what, where you would think that democracy, equality leads on to some assumption of actual substantial equality, like equal access, equal ability to benefit from um, a public education system, equal ability to benefit from courts of law and justice, uh, he's saying, no, well, actually, no. Okay. To the bureaucracy, to see the mass, the unemployed, the, the propertyless mass of people with their demands is, uh, it is a direct challenge to bureaucracy. Okay. Because bureaucracy cannot be making these, uh, or rather, rational objectivity doesn't account for questions of what should be um, of ethics, all right, of substance. All right. Okay, any questions around that? Uh, I, I've given you the page numbers there in the hope that you will go and read this because it's not easy to explain in the moment. Um, but go and look at those at those pages and uh, you'll get the idea, okay? All right, so when we then look at collective action and we're saying, let's go back, we're saying that successful social movements become larger they become larger and then they need to establish bureaucratic processes in order to be able to meet the needs of the people that they are so that they are representing the people that they emerged from in the first place and that because they lead into bureaucracies, they are then no longer able to uh, meet the needs of, of their people. They, they are less effective at actually 
representing the interests of people out there. All right, so if you say, okay, well, in social movements, is it inevitable that social movements are going to become bureaucracies? Well, there are different types of authority in social movements. Uh, charismatic authority is probably dominant in social movements rather than a legal rational authority. So in the first place, there might be a distinct difference and an irreconcilable difference between um, movements that emerge through collective action, okay, social movements, that they don't easily transfer into bureaucratic rational legal, right? But that isn't, you know, the people in, in positions of authority, their authority is based on personal characteristics quite often. Um, But on the other hand, if a social movement is to become sustainable and grow in size, how else would you be able to manage uh, that administration of a large number of, of people, right? So it's that, it's that difficulty that that there isn't, you can't think of another way to do it apart from bureaucracy. Okay, but that it off bureaucracy often offers challenges as well as opportunities for social movements. Um, when we go on next week, and for those people who have joined late, we have a new venue. The we've moved from the old grandstand, which I should have realized the name, uh, has very old equipment um, that no longer works to the new commerce building, which has um, equipment, which they promised me works very well. And I've, yeah, we're dealing with computer services to make damn sure that the exact venue that I'm in is actually operational. But so you will be able to join in class next week. Uh, and what we're gonna look at, go on to look, look at is the, um, the, the opposition and I don't, I don't believe it's an opposition, but the, the contest to bureaucracy that there's no way that it doesn't result in an oligarchy in a small number of people using this immense power of bureaucracy in their own interests. And that the rational legal authority doesn't actually continue that as soon as people are in these positions, they operate to their own personal benefit. Okay. And with that, we move on to look at unions in South Africa and say, well, are they bureaucratic? If they are bureaucratic, does that mean that they can't represent their, their members, their um, the people that they emerged from? Uh, are they an oligarchy? There's another reading that I think I think I'm going to uh, add to your list so you can get it online. It'll be on um, Alwazi, but it's not in your official list. Just that it makes it easier to understand the argument around oligarchy. Um, you know, around the fact that you are re-electing the same people every year doesn't mean that they are oligarchs. All right, if that person is being elected or that party is being democratically elected, it's, it's, it's quite feasible that that is legitimate authority. It's not necessarily an illegitimate oligar oligarchic um, process. All right. So any questions from that? We're ending here. Okay, so hopefully now, yes, Gabriel. Gabriel's good. Nokubunga, the other one who arrived 
on time. Are you okay? Right. Okay, Mandela's talking. Yes. No, thank you. <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks, Cynthia. Okay. Okay. Right. I am good. Thank you. Great, Nakabonga. Okay, so um now that we've kind of met each other, um think about the questions that you have. I mean it's great if you can have questions beforehand. There's gonna be the one area where I see it's gonna be difficult is I don't know if my microphone is gonna pick up the questions from the class. And I'll try to remember to repeat the questions that we then discuss. Um, uh, I'm concerned that I won't. Maybe you have to interrupt me and say, what was that question? OK, um, please do that. Otherwise, you're not getting the benefit of being in a class. Okay? Um, and maybe we can have the best of both worlds here, that we have a group interaction, uh, even though you're not in the same environment. All right, so I will see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Okay, and uh, this will be available shortly. It takes a uh, half an hour or an hour or so to, to process itself. All right, thank you. Have a lovely day. Thank you. You too, Christine. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.